All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I am Mitty Figueredo, the Deputy Director of Administration for Montgomery Parks here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you for joining us today for the February session of the Montgomery Parks Speaker Series. Today's session covers a topic that many of us see every day, if we're lucky, public art, and is going to cover how changes in our society are affecting it. But first, um, let me give you a few housekeeping notes. The session is recorded and posted to our website for future viewing. We will have a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. You may submit questions via the Q&A box throughout the session, and I'll try to address as many questions as possible during the last 15 minutes to our speaker. Now, some quick background on Montgomery Parks. We're a department of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, a bi-county agency made up of Prince George's County Parks, Recreation and Planning Departments, and Montgomery Planning and Parks Departments. We manage 420 parks here in Montgomery County, spanning 37,000 acres of parkland. We have hundreds of amenities from historic sites and athletic fields to trails and lakes, and of course, urban parks. That brings us to today's topic coming of age post-pandemic public art. Often urban parks are enhanced by the inclusion of art, sculptures, memorials, and, and mosaics reflect how artists see the world and what a community values. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic and protests for racial justice rocked the world and in the public, in the process, public art thrived. Today's guest is an expert in public art, Jack Becker has worked in the field for 45 years as an artist, curator, writer, and publisher. He currently serves on committees for the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and the Institute for Public Art and the Public Art Exchange. Jack, thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Mitty. Mitty? <laughs> hi, Mitty. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to Maryland Park, uh, excuse me, um, Montgomery Parks in Maryland. Um, and hi to everyone in Maryland and around the country. And I think maybe even a few folks around the world. Really pleased to be here and honored. I want to thank uh, Melissa and Hu Jung for also uh, organizing this. Uh, thanks for your work. I'm going to jump right in and get started um, by sharing my screen. Okay, so I want to start out by offering uh, a land acknowledgement. I, I live in Minnesota, and I wish to honor the Dakota and the Anishinaabe people whose homeland I occupy, and thank Dakota ancestors for their stewardship of this place. So the title of my talk, Coming of Age, Post-Pandemic Public Art, it doesn't assume, as you might guess, that we're in the pandemic, we're out of the pandemic woods yet. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background first, a uh, few examples of some of my work, the things I occupy my time with as an artist. Uh, one is uh, my car got turned into an art car a few years ago after I retired from Forecast, where I worked for 42 years. This is the chroma car. It's basically my Honda Civic covered in stickers that are holographic and uh, reflect and uh, refract sunlight. I've joined the art car community here in the Twin Cities. It's a fun group that organizes parades. And uh, during COVID, we went riding around to neighborhoods where people were isolated and uh, held up signs, uh, keep on caregiving, and we love you, and to help people who were in senior homes and healthcare facilities to feel like people cared about them. I also, uh, you may already know me because of uh, my reputation being on the cover of Elevator World magazine, which I'm sure you all read. Uh, this was an elastic sculpture I did back in 1984 that was operated by people pushing the button in the elevator, making it go up and down. It's called attention spam. And here's a labyrinth I created with help from uh, colleagues and uh, it has a cloud hovering over it. It was for a one night festival called Northern Spark in St. Paul. And during the one night, over a thousand people walked the labyrinth. Uh, I gave them noise canceling headphones to block out sound. 
and they quietly walked the labyrinth for about a minute. And afterwards, uh, they were invited to write down their thoughts or comments or whatever was on their mind. And I learned about the healing power of labyrinths and gained a lot of insight by asking people what their experience was like. Uh, some people wrote, uh, my mind's a blank, or I can't think of anything. And I took that as a sign that uh, walking a labyrinth can clear your mind of whatever's bothering you at the time or what's ever getting in the way of your thoughts. So that got me thinking more and more about health in public art and the healing and uh, the experience of public art that you can create for audiences. This is a do-it-yourself fountain uh, done off the Stone Arch Bridge in Minneapolis. It's basically a bucket and a rope and people figure out what to do. They throw the bucket down into the Mississippi River below, can pull a bucket of water up and then make their own fountain. I love the, um, the notion of creating an opportunity for people to create the art themselves or activate the art themselves. And uh, now I'm gonna jump into my talk. Uh, while I have the title of post-pandemic, I'm referring to not only COVID, but systemic racism and the climate crisis. These are all pandemics we're facing right now and all pandemics that may or may not be over, but they're pandemics that are mm, offering us opportunities to examine some of the lessons that we could learn um, based on how public art and artists working in public spaces have uh, addressed these or raised issues around them um, and served audiences in spite of. There are some big picture questions that I'd like to uh, you know, address here. Um, what role will public spaces and public art play in the health of individual communities and the planet, including healing and recovery? How will artists help Americans to come to terms with our history of systemic racism and preserve our democracy? And how will we increase the public's perception of artists working in the community, and uh, how do we effectively support this complex and challenging work? Now I'm gonna go move through some of my slides rather quickly, and I hope you'll forgive me if I don't give you time to read everything or talk about everything, but I'm uh, mindful of the time that I have, and I can talk for hours about the topic. I'm also mindful of the fact this is being recorded and folks can come back and look at this and spend more time with it, uh, than we're going to spend today. So it's more of a skim, skimming the surface than diving deep, and uh, hope that'll work for you all. Of course, there's many, many types of public art, and this is just a selection of types, and more are being developed every day as new technologies are being developed, as artists meet uh, professionals or practitioners in other sectors, and they form collaborations. There's really no limit to the range of work that artists can explore in the public realm and the kinds of audiences they can reach. Suzanne Lacey is an artist I met uh, early on in my career who drew a Venn diagram on a napkin for me and it stuck with me ever since. The three circles she drew were education, community, and public policy. And she explained to me that public art is really at the intersection of all of these. So I hope that uh, you'll keep this in mind as, we're, as we run through these slides and images and uh, see how it resonates for you. There's a lot of ways to describe public art. Here's some of my long list. I like to think of it as a cultural barometer. You know, oftentimes we can tell a lot about a community by seeing what kind of public art they have uh, or lack of public art that they might have. Certainly public art offers uh, opportunity for conversation and to meet strangers that otherwise you wouldn't have conversations with. And it's definitely a professional field. Um, and it's one that a lot of people are entering and wondering how to succeed at. 
It's also important to note it's a subset of a larger sphere of arts and culture. Public art plans for cities have to take into account the larger sphere of arts and culture and not necessarily separate those two things. It's certainly more than artwork placed in public as we'll learn more about. There's a process and a product. There's a cause and effect experiment really going on for the artists and people commissioning art. Uh, and over time, you learn every project you do, how people respond to it, and was it what you intended, and what changes you might want to make going forward. So the art of creating public art is the art of having an impact on audiences, and how do we do that, and how do we improve that? You may have conceptions around public art, we all have our own, but maybe you haven't thought about it in the way that uh, some other folks have. For example, it could be privately funded and on private property, but if it's publicly visible, say art in a library and accessible, uh, you know, it can be very um, public, so to speak. It could be in a storefront window or a rooftop. It could be privately commissioned or publicly commissioned. It can certainly involve lots of people rather than just one artist creating artwork in a public space. It can be controversial, offensive. It can be very risky. It can be loved and then hated or vice versa. And it can um, usually unintentionally contribute to gentrification, but it can also serve as a magnet for cultural tourism. And these two obviously can go hand in hand. So one of the things I'm most proud of in my career is uh, founding the publication Public Art Review, which lasted for 32 years or so. And it put uh, Forecast, the organization I was running, sort of in the center of the public art wheel and all kinds of information from all over the world was coming through us and back out through uh, two issues a year that we printed. Uh, now Forecast has an online publication called Forward but you can also check out all the archives of Public Art Review online through their archive. On the cover of the last issue, um, or one of the last issues is the teeter-totter installation at the US-Mexico border, uh, a powerful piece that uh, was only up for 45 minutes before it had to be disassembled. Now, how is public art coming of age? Um, there's lots of ways that I see it, including the uh, number of studies that have been done around public art and uh, the amount of support that's increasing, including foundation support. Um, there's a lot of growth of new and grassroots programs. There's huge diversity that's starting to enter the field, not only artists, but curators, consultants, program managers, people serving on selection panels, et cetera. Public art has certainly proven itself in serving racial and social justice activism, as you're going to see, as well as eco activism. And uh, more cities are recognizing public art as an economic asset, a community development and cultural development asset, and it's being recognized in the public health and education worlds as well. So programs today are starting to rethink the way they're doing things, and that's leading to some other coming of age moments for these public art programs, which there are some 700 around the country. Likewise, there's some new searchable archives and online resources. Um, uh, we can talk more about that at the end. There's even an international public art award program through the Institute for Public Art. So a few examples of artists that I admire and the types of work that they do that I think has influenced the work being done now and going forward in terms of post pandemic public art. This is Candy Chang and her Before I Die mural, which is basically a chalk mural that anybody, anybody can order online and create in their own communities. Uh, and you provide a cup of chalk and people just know what to do. They start writing in the, the blank space, like, hello, my name is, and put your name up there. 
But Candy Chang is brilliant at creating public art that's more of a vehicle for other people's expression rather than her artwork. And I think it's a really good example of artists creating platforms or opportunities for the community to express itself, for the community to make the art. Or Jack Mackey's dance series in, Chicago, uh, in Seattle, where he basically provided dance instruction steps on the sidewalk and unsuspecting couples coming upon these would know exactly what to do. And uh, in a sense, public art is a manipulator of our behaviors. Uh, it could be for better or worse, but in this case, it could be for much better. <laughs> or Lorna Jordan, who created this waterworks garden um, in Kent, Washington at a public works facility that people love so much they get married there. And it's just uh, got lots of detail and wonderful uh, treatment to every surface throughout, as well as all the plantings. This project by Dred Scott, um, I'll just read a little bit about that uh, with a quote from Dred Scott. It's a, it's a performance about the struggle for freedom. He says, people have taken great risks in a struggle for emancipation and have often been battered in the process. The performance referenced the 1963 civil rights struggle in Birmingham, Alabama, in which the government used high pressure water jets from fire hoses against nonviolent protesters and bystanders in an effort to maintain segregation and legalize discrimination. And Dred Scott, uh, again, is one of the leading artists who is helping bring to life some of the issues of uh, institutional um, and embedded racism uh, throughout our history. Conflict Kitchen is a fascinating project, an experiment in bridging cultures and people who have suspicions about countries with whom the US has conflict. And what they did was create a sort of a pop-up uh, storefront cafe where foods from those countries where the US has conflicts uh, could be served and people could learn about the cultures and the foods uh, in the wrappers that the food came in. Or Parking Day, which was started by a group called Rebar out of San Francisco in 2005, which basically happens every September around the world, as far as I know, where you can take over a parking space, transform it into a more public space. And as long as you're pl plugging the meter, you're legal. And uh, this is a great example of uh, people just taking matters into their own hands and creating spaces in the streetscapes normally reserved for cars and turning them into people spaces or octopied, um, showing what you can do with your own uh, set of inflatable octopus tentacles. Um, and of course, the social media that follows a project like this that helps an artist with their career building. The shock value of public art can't be underestimated. And uh, I don't know if this caused any traffic jams, but you can imagine, you know, this is the kind of thing that people come upon by surprise and then they have to stop, they have to take it in. It's uh, an attention getter. We can't ignore festivals and parades, uh, Burning Man, uh, there's an art car parade here in the Twin Cities and a few around the country. There's a group called Squonk Opera that does these giant puppets and orchestrates and tours around to festivals around the country. I'm a huge fan of Christo and Jean-Claude and I got to visit the Floating Piers project they did in Italy, which basically invited people to just walk on the water on these floating piers. And uh, you can't help but smile and, uh, and enjoy just hanging out and uh, this notion of um, creating experiences for people that are short-lived, uh, two weeks or so, uh, is something that Christo and Jean-Claude are uh, famous for. Uh, the AIDS quilt is something I also got to see the last iteration of it in Washington, D.C. in 1996. Uh, and it gave me um, a lot of um, 
respect for people who try to organize projects of this scale in honor of trying to change uh, education and policies around, in this case, AIDS and HIV, um, and prove very effective in raising that awareness, but also gave people the opportunity to grieve and uh, occasionally come upon a blank quilt which they could write their own remembrance on. So again, audience participation was a key factor along with people on a stage that were reciting the names of all the people over a three-day period of this installation. So this brings us to the topic of healing and recovery, which is really happening now as we're trying to struggle not only with COVID, which is still around, but other pandemics that I mentioned. Um, this idea of creative caring and giving people the opportunity to grieve or honor like the AIDS quilt did, or creating meaningful and safe social spaces. I mean, especially when I think about parks, I think they were the places that people could still go and be safe. And what were the opportunities for social interaction in those outdoor spaces? And how could art and art activities uh, encourage people to come out of isolation and stay connected? Um, of course, we're exploring new forms of monuments while we're trying to and have successfully gotten rid of many unwanted public art monuments and memorials. Um, this idea of contributing to collective joy or creating a sense of pride in place, uh, helping with the reforms that are needed in education around environment and healthcare. And also thinking about public-private partnerships that lead to arts and cultural prosperity. Likewise, some of the government programs, as I mentioned, are starting to reevaluate the way they've been doing business, the way they've been selecting art, the uh, diversity of their public art collections. And some are starting to conduct audits, which I think is an excellent starting point. Um, Let's see, there's so many things I could talk about. I need to keep moving on though. But I love the idea that more research is and demonstration projects are underway and that we're testing, as I said, iteratively, what's working and what isn't and moving toward the promising practices. They're not necessarily uh, all best practices, but that's how we learn. And early on during COVID, these were some of the artistic reactions, you know, helping honor care, caregivers, recognizing love in the time of COVID, and even having fun with the uh, lack of toilet paper that might be available in the stores. I love this project by Adam Kuby out of Portland called the Acupuncture Project, which uh, is a metaphor for how do we identify and put a needle in the spot that needs attention or needs relief. So these giant acupuncture needles were created and placed around sites uh, needing attention or relief or uh, environmental remediation around Portland. And there's many examples of what's happened as uh, monuments have been coming down and the questions of what to do next or even what to do with the removed monuments. We could have a, our conversation around that alone. Here in Minnesota, Native American activists pulled down the statue of Christopher Columbus. And a man, here's a picture of a man kicking the statue as it lay face down. Uh, there was a comment in the newspaper the next day uh, saying this should have been subtitled, Columbus Faces the New World. But times are definitely changing and people's value systems are starting to adjust to the uh, times that we're in. And I think it's a long, slow turn that we're making toward more uh, equitable and uh, effective public art and monuments. This monument to new immigrants is an elevated statue of an immigrant child whose face and torso are left blank and unmarked by race or ethnicity or gender. 
Uh, it's molded uh, from clay, but unfired, so it remains vulnerable to outdoor conditions. And the artist says that a statue represents a, uh, a kid as a metaphor for what is experienced once you immigrate. No matter how old a person is, they need to start over. The idea behind the statue is not to represent a particular community, but all the immigrants. For this reason, they don't have any specific gender or appearance. They do not have a face. The lack of facial details is a way to emphasize a sense of carity that immigrants experience. They are not always in one place. Part of them is somewhere else in their home country and their identity is formed by their experiences in their new place. Now, I live in South Minneapolis, uh, only about three miles from where George Floyd was murdered. The ripple effects of that were felt very prominently here and in my neighborhood and around the world. Uh, murals of George Floyd and Black Lives Matters murals and boarded up windows uh, along major commercial corridors here, including Lake Street, which is two blocks from my house. And George Floyd Square, we could talk about for over an hour too, is a memorial site now, but it's one that wasn't planned. It wasn't designed by an artist. It grew up organically by the people who cared and the stakeholders invested in that site. Um, and uh, it's, I think, uh, a fascinating case study that needs to be looked at again and again. Uh, how do we allow the community to help create the kind of memorial they want? And this site, of course, has uh, evolved over time. Once closed off to traffic, eventually they had to create a traffic circle. There's Gorilla Gardens at George Floyd Square and this uh, portrait mounted to a bus shelter by Peyton Scott Russell is one of the renowned uh, mur uh, murals of George Floyd that people have seen all over the world. But this idea of guerrilla gardening and creating plants or bringing plants and taking care of them as part of the healing process is, is important to recognize. Near George Floyd Square, again, without warning, a pop-up cemetery appeared. And uh, this is another powerful addition to the George Floyd Square. Each headstone is printed with a name, date, and location of the death of, of people who've died from police brutality. African Americans who have died at the hands of police. Um, it was installed in time for Juneteenth, less than a month after Floyd was murdered. Um, the cemetery also hosts candlelight vigils and remains a, in place to this day, which says a lot about the artists and the thought put into this, even though it was done without permission, it's still there today. And on Lake Street, not far from my house, was a boarded up building that uh, eventually had a fence put up around it. And a group of volunteers from the community decided we could do something about this and give visibility to artists while the building is getting renovated. Called Dream Sequences, it featured eight artists, uh, mostly BIPOC artists from the community. And one of the artists was a native artist from the community, Gordon. Uh, Coons, whose piece um, in this, uh, I would just want to mention briefly, it's called Man Transferring into Healer. It's a series of five images. Uh, he says, Makwa is a symbol for a bear who has three roles in the Ojibwa clan. Makwa is a protector, teacher, and healer. In the first panel, man is small and inside Makwa, learning how to be a healer. When man's training is complete, he will emerge as a healer. By the fifth image on the right, man is larger and Makwa is smaller and within man for all time. Makwa will always be inside man for guidance in the future. The Ojibwa man has now transformed into a healer from teachings from Makwa for the tribe. And of course, thinking about 
man transferring into healer, you know, just brings to light again more about the idea of recovery and healing and rebuilding that we're going through now. There are a lot of critical challenges facing the public art field going forward. And coincidentally, these also offer opportunities. But one of the critical challenges certainly is that we all have a different idea of what public art is or should be, and we don't have a shared vocabulary. In fact, it's rarely even taught in schools. Most audiences aren't aware of who did the art, where it came from, why it's there. Um, the media doesn't always help us with the understanding of public art or appreciation. For artists, it's a real minefield. Uh, can often lead to controversy, can often be misunderstood. You know, some of the most controversial and hated public art in the world has in time become some of the most beloved. Uh, the Eiffel Tower, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, where I grew up. Uh, many of the ordinances cities have right now are restrictive and they're unable to support a broad range of creative work. They're mostly commissioning using capital resources to create permanent fixed art. Many of the collections around the country are aging, they're outdated, uh, they need equity audits. Um, and some public art is just irrelevant or it's plop art that was just a work of art placed in public that people don't care about. Uh, and then, of course, there's the privatization of public space and likewise the publicization of private spaces. So we have a couple of privately owned parks in Minneapolis. And that idea of a privately owned public space raises a lot of questions, but also offers huge opportunities. A huge issue is the fact that we really need to broaden the diversity of voices and artists and bring local talent pool up to the ability to compete for commission opportunities in our own communities. How do we offer more training and micro grants to emerging artists so they can start building their career and find out what their focus as an artist might be, what aspects of issues in the world they want to address. Uh, many cities have public art deserts, places that are just void of public art and underserved audiences that uh, are in those places. Like food deserts, you know, we need to think more broadly about who are the audience for public art, who isn't getting public art, and how can we serve them? We certainly don't have standards in the field. There's no licensing uh, for many artists. That's uh, a license to do whatever you want to do, and that can be great. For others, it's a frustration. We still need more research about the impacts of public art to help improve the policies and find more support, more support systems. But it's a challenge to measure the impact of public art. And the art world, you know, the, the world that's about buying and selling art or getting into major museums, really public art is off their radar and it operates outside of that. We don't think about public art as something we can buy and sell. Uh, I have a few more examples before I wrap up here. Here in the Twin Cities where I live and I think in a lot of cities around the country, there were racial covenants put into the deeds that limited purchasing abilities for Blacks, in some cases Jews, and some case, in other cases uh, other immigrants. Um, and uh, many people don't know that they have a racial covenant on their deed. So an initiative was started here to help people who wanted to find out if they did have that covenant on their deeds and to have it removed so this lawn sign project offered people whose houses had racial covenants and went through the process of getting them removed uh, to promote that on their lawns and then talk to their neighbors. And pretty soon hundreds and eventually thousands of people have started addressing the, uh, the need to remove racial covenants from the deeds. But more importantly, to think about the systemic racism that even brought us to the point where uh, our community, be, community could be so segregated simply because of the way the government and the banks 
uh, limited who could buy homes in certain neighborhoods. Uh, here's an example of a platform uh, for public art uh, created by uh, a really diverse group, a team of artists called Carry On Homes, who mostly all came to the Twin Cities from different places in the world. And so this stage that they created in a park for a summer uh, was a platform for performances. And you can see these are painted suitcases and the idea of carry on, what you bring with you uh, to your new home. And what are, the, uh, what are the voices in that community that need to be unpacked? Here's an installation by Angela Two Stars, uh, a native artist here in the Twin Cities on one of the sites that, uh, again, was damaged after uh, the uprising following George Floyd's murder. And you can tell by looking at it that it involved hundreds of people writing things that she later wove into this uh, project. And so, again, this idea of audience participation, or like Candy Chang, you know, creating a venue for other people to fill in the blanks. And then I'll wrap up with this installation that was done at our premier retail venue in the Twin Cities, the Mall of America, which actually has an environmental program. And uh, they wanted an artist who could use recycled materials to create an artwork. Um, and Christopher Letter Gardella created this out of basically repurposed trash to uh, be dedicated on Earth Day in 2019. And this gets reinstalled every year. And uh, when it was first installed, it had a rope that allowed people on the floor to pull on it and uh, move the wings of the, the mama monarch in the center. But that got used up and they had to remove the rope after the second or third iteration. Um, I've got a bunch of resources listed for you, uh, including Forecast, the Institute for Public Art. As I mentioned, they do the International Award. Um, other groups that I think you might find interesting and we can talk about if you wanna know more about them. Uh, and then also, uh, I'm currently reading a book that I'm finding really helpful, The Story's Whiteness Tells Itself by David Murrow, who's also from Minneapolis and a great blog post uh, by Amina Cooper, who um, again, really uh, drives the point home with this quote. It's time we talk about the lack of diversity within our public art commissions, our artist selection panels, and our public art workforce. We need to address the elitism with which we dictate to communities, which artworks are accept acceptable and which persons and cultures are worth affirming with monuments and with beautiful objects. So I'll uh, leave you with that and uh, stop sharing my screen. Jack, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed that presentation and all the images you shared. Um, we're going to start our Q&A session now, um, but I'm going to um, take sort of a, a point of order here and um, go ahead and, and ask you the first question, which is, is, is my question. And first, I, I want to, I want to share that a year or two ago, when we were having a discussion about, um, uh, implementing a piece of public art in one of our parks here, um, in the Silver Spring area, I was told by a community member that, um, parks departments shouldn't have anything to do with art because we're not museums. Um, and therefore we should, quote, stay in our lane. And of course, I really thought about that a lot because um, as a parks department, we are stewards of public spaces. And, you know, I believe that we should be at the forefront of creating opportunities for art that brings people into our public spaces. It should be a critical role for us. But, you know, there are a lot of challenges in doing it. And you laid many of those out. Um, I love that you showed examples of art that is ephemeral and mobile and sometimes activated by people themselves who are engaging with the art. Do you think that implementing these kinds of artworks 
um, are useful in preparing a community to accept art that might be more challenging or provoking or different from what they're used to. In other words, is what you know, what are the pros and cons of you know, more temporary ephemeral artworks like that versus something that is more permanent. Um, because, you know, here in DC, we're surrounded by monumental artwork. And I think that's what people have come to expect. So mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit about the pros and cons of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Mitty. That's a great question. And, you know, there's, I could do a whole talk for an hour about art and parks, you know, and there's art parks, you know, parks that are basically outdoor museums uh, with art that basically could be cited in any park around the country. So that's art in public places, right? But some of the most dynamic and effective public art programs in this country are, are, in, are housed within the parks departments of cities or counties or regional parks. And I think that's important to note because the people who are running parks, as you suggest, are interested in programming and people and bringing people to those spaces. So if you think about it, like I was saying, you know, for artists to want to maybe push the envelope a little bit with riskier ideas and more controversial projects, it's this uh, trial and error, right? Cause and effect experiment that you see how it goes and then you either build on that or, oh, that didn't go so well, let's do something different next time. And I think by extension of a parks program or a public art program based within a park system should look at it the same way as what are opportunities for local artists? What are opportunities for local nonprofit groups and performance groups to have a stage, basically a venue in the park that serves an audience. And again, every park has its own audiences. Some parks like in DC attract audiences from all around the world. So it's gonna vary place by place as to what you know about your audience and what their tastes are, what their uh, value systems might be, right? And I'd say start out on the safe side and work your way toward the more controversial, you know, because you want to start building trust that this is a system that I want to come, you know, park that I want to come back to. I want to see what else they do. So artist design seating and artist design playgrounds could be permanent fixtures, but they don't have to be permanent either. But the extent to which you know your audience and maybe even talk with your audience about public art and what they would like to see could also inform a public art plan or at least a season. You could hire a curator and say, we're gonna work with them to see what they would do in our parks. Either way, I mean, resources are needed and that's usually the biggest challenge for any public type of agency or tax funded agency is spending tax dollars on public art. But the good thing about a lot of parks is they have private conservancies and partners that can help make that happen outside of tax funded. Uh, you know, where's my tax dollar going? That's when people can get really upset with you. But you know, if you have partners going forward for the arts part of it, I think it's another good way to you know dip your toe in that water. Yeah, that's that's a a very yeah, that's a very valid point about the funding source. It, it, I think, can make a difference in how people react to a particular piece of art, especially if it's challenging. Um, they'll focus on, you know, how 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 it was funded. Um, but you know, we think that providing opportunities for people to engage with public art is, as I said, a, a critical part of our mission and something that you know the Parks Department should be engaged right. in. Um, but you know, the how is 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 part of our right. challenge. Um, I want to don't shy away from yeah. challenges, you know, because that's what gets conversations started. Yes. If you do something that that's really nice and nobody talks about, you could say it wasn't worth it. Yeah, I, we 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 um right. We want we don't want it to just be a form of like boosterism for an existing community, right? We we want something that makes people kind of think more um, and and engage more. But that's sometimes mm. gets gets a little bit of a you know, stirs the pot yeah. a little bit. And That's of course, you've got bad. nature, a natural environment also, which can be very healing. And community gardens, I should mention, are another great way of giving people a vested interest in, yes. say, a small parcel. And that process isn't unlike a successful type of public art project that gets the community involved. And yes, the fruits of right. their labor are shared, right? Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Thank you. 
Um, so I, I, ha I have a question here from one of our listeners. Um, and uh, I adore public art, but I'm aware that it has much greater value when someone like you interprets it, an element that's absent when one walks by. Um, for example, your explanation of the immigrant statue, I would not have known that that was the artist's intention, um, but it offers a much richer experience. Otherwise, public art can feel empty. Is there any movement toward providing a bit, bit of explanation for artworks and in what forms? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's so true that you don't know the story. And there's so many stories. And the artist doesn't necessarily want to make it explicit. Some want that mystery or want their work to be open to interpretation. And I think people are tired of just looking for the plaque, you know, that too, which often there isn't even one. And so you don't even know who the artist is. Uh, but the good news is with technology now, there are a lot of, um, you know, downloadable apps that allow you to appreciate and learn the stories of public art uh, in your community. So for example, um, I think Westaff and their Public Art Archive, which is a really great resource, have worked with communities that have collections to create a, a mobile app that allows you to learn about the art on site. And in some cases, like Museum Without Walls in New York, they, you might even hear an interview from the artist while you're there on site. So enriching the educational opportunity on site is now available with locational, you know, devices that know where you are and know what art you're standing next to. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I experienced something like that um, recently in Montreal this past summer with an iPhone walking from site to site, getting a presentation. And that would be something um, really exciting to implement if you had a nice full public art program. Um, Another question from our audience, um, and this is about defining public art. If public art can be publicly or privately owned and displayed on private or public land or buildings, would you say then that public art is any art that is publicly displayed? Um, well, any art that's publicly displayed, if it's in the public domain, it's freely accessible, yes. Yeah. For good or bad. <laughs> yeah, for right, that's right. You know, but also we don't know if it got permission or not either. So there's so many factors, again, that might contribute to, is it legitimate public art? Was it a, a okayed by the property owner that said the artist could do this on their property? And that's a very contentious issue that's come up, you know. When a lot of the boarded windows happened along Lake Street, people were grateful that muralists and others just started encrusting these with paint and signs and, and words of protest and caution and you know, but better than boarded up windows? Yes. And is art in a vacant storefront better than a vacant storefront? Yes. So, but, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder and everybody will have their own opinions about whatever you put out there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I, I think it does. I think it does. Um, so I want to bring it back uh, home to us for a second. Um, we recently approved a policy plan. It's called PROS. That's an acronym um, for Parks, Recreation, and Open Space. Um, and uh, it states that one of the core purposes of parks is to foster social connectivity. Um, that is using public space to build a shared sense of community. Can you talk a little bit about how public art can contribute uh, effectively to building social capital or social connection? And are there certain kinds of public art that do this better than others? Great questions. Um, yes, there's so many ways that you could look at that part of your mission and say, we have to be funding public art because it is one of the key tools in creating social interaction and getting strangers to meet each other and have conversations. I mean, what else does that really? And uh, so the, one key, I think, is having interactive public art, art that begs for you to interact, touch, move, uh, spark a conversation. So Candy Chang's wall that people write on, then you see what they wrote and you write your own. People see what you wrote. Now you're in a conversation about why did you write that? And pretty soon you're learning a backstory from a stranger that gets you thinking more empathetically about who's your neighbors and what's going on next door or around the community. You know, that's just one little facet of a way that public art strategically done and in the right setting where people feel predisposed to want to interact, they don't feel like they're on camera or that sort of thing, 
Um, but there's so many others, you know. Um, I know some artists who've created little time capsules, you know, where they have like a, their art is a map of the neighborhood and each uh, pole has, uh, is representing a house on a block and each pole has an opportunity to put a message in there or something you know about that place. So it's like this idea of all the stories of all the homes in our neighborhood could actually be stored in a place. Even if we don't see them, we know that's what's there. And this idea that a neighborhood is filled with so many great stories and so much history. And when do we get to know it? When do we get to hear it? But of course, one of the most important things I mentioned is whose story isn't being told? Who doesn't get to see themselves in the public art in their community? And if we start to focus or prioritize some of those types of projects to help bring more equity and balance, more equality to the sense of whose voices can be heard in public and should we be listening to, I think it's really important because I, I will say it's, a, it's not only an empowering field to work in, it is power. If you get to say what you're gonna put in a public space for everybody to see and somehow learn from, or be enlightened by, or somehow right, pay attention to, that's a position of power. So we really have to think about it in that way and ask whose power are we projecting? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, you know, at Montgomery Parks, we um, look at every project we engage in through an equity lens. Um, and, and, you know, we have to, as we do that, be mindful of the fact that many of the types of outreach and engagement we've always used in the past actually continue empowering a smaller group of vocal residents, as opposed to a larger, broader swath of the community who we haven't always heard from, but whose input we actually need and, and depend on. Um, so we have to think differently about outreach, but we also want to be nimble, responsive. We want, and this is hard for government, we want to try things and take some risks and learn from the things that we do. And we have to balance that desire um, and, and the need to engage a broader community um, with some kind of approval process um, with the ability to just do things, right? Because sometimes it's the doing of them that teaches us something that then informs what we do next. So I guess my question for you is how do we balance that need to engage different people and to make sure all the voices are being heard with developing an approval process for more permanent artwork, right? That um, isn't so lengthy and cumbersome that we don't actually ever get any artwork out there. Well, without the term artwork, you know, your question could apply to so many institutions right. and industries, right? Right. We're all, we're all in a, in a uh, you know, similar situation, especially if it's a predominantly white community that's trying to understand how can we become more diverse? How can we practice what we are preaching and what kinds of policies are preventing that and which ones are helping us? And who are our advisors and whose voices are we centering in the decision making? So oftentimes, you know, with bureaucracy, which I also want to recognize as an art form in itself, um, you know, it's like found object sculpture, all the raw material are there to create something meaningful and beautiful. So it behooves you and all park systems and all bureaucratic systems to ask what are all the assets in our community? What are all the components to make this a better place? You know, what are all the voices that need to be heard? So you may already have advisory groups, right? You may already have temporary groups that come together for some reason and then disband, right? Yeah. And then you have the upper echelons of well, who's taking that information into account and what's that makeup? And does that need to be looked at more carefully? And then there's probably another layer on top of that that relates to laws uh, and regulations been passed that that um, you know, agency is beholding to. So a lot of it has to do with transparency and being really open about what you can and can't do and what the systems are that you're working with and, and how can you push the envelope in terms of that system to make those voices that aren't heard heard and the influence of what needs to happen now happen now. And as you know, a lot of the public art that happens that's most impactful is pop-up. 
it yeah. wasn't planned. So, yeah. and how do you allow for pop-up? How do you design that into your programming? Uh, how do you give some of your budget over to the community to decide how to spend? You know, there's just, there's so many factors. One idea, you might want to take a page from the early forecast program I started, which was a micro-grant program. So what kind of art projects? We not only want your art in here, we want to pay you to do the art, and we have a process for funding that. $1,000 can go a long way for one artist trying to get their first or second or third project done, especially if they have backup, you know, and a site and an audience already built in. So, uh, yeah, and then the process of reviewing and selecting those, that becomes really critical. Yes. Uh, but you can imagine what I'm, where I'm going with this. It's not you decide who gets to do the art. It's let the artist tell you what they want to do and asking the park, what does it want to be <laughs> for yes. the people? Yes, I, 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 yeah, I love that. Um, let, let me ask you this. We have a few more minutes. Um, you're from Minneapolis. You're, um, what other cities um, would you say are getting this right? Oh, <laughs> I don't know that we're getting it right here in Minneapolis. And I have to say, there's often a divide between what goes on inside City Hall and what's going on in the arts community at the grassroots sure. level. And there really is a strong top-down public arts system and you know, governmental system across sure. the country. And there are some really thriving bottom-up programs around the country. So, you know, Seattle and San Francisco, uh, Philadelphia, um, you know, there's so many great cities that have pu public art programs that are multifaceted, what I might call a really healthy public art ecosystem. Yes, yes, okay? yes. And we have a very healthy public art ecosystem, but it isn't because of what the city of Minneapolis does per se. You think it's more because there is a strong, you, in, in places where the, the, the local government is getting it right, they are adopting more of a bottom up process is what you're saying. Yeah, well, maybe in some maybe. cases, you know, this goes back to why parks maybe instead of a public works program or department running public art. Right. Because you just want bricks and mortar, you know, that's a public works kind of approach. Yes. Parks is much more interested in programmatic and maybe has resources that aren't restricted to bricks and mortar. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So this goes again back to what systems are trying to enable what kinds of public art. But some of the best public art programs are starting to evaluate and audit their programs, like Indianapolis just did. Asking the questions, how are we selecting art? What does our collection look like? How do we start to bring more balance to it? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. But every city, wow. Atlanta, you know, so many great cities. I can't begin. And they all have their good components and their challenging ones. But well, thank you for that. This has been um, I'm going to start to wrap it up. This has been an incredible presentation. I, I, I wish I could talk to you for another hour about all this. Um, or we want to embark on on some of this exciting work ourselves. Um, so I, I I want to thank you again um, and share with everyone in the audience that um, we have a public art project happening here in Montgomery Parks. We're currently seeking submissions for an art installation at the newly built Jean Lynch Urban Park in downtown Silver Spring. So for more information on the call for qualifications for that public art installation, please visit montgomeryparks.org and search for Jean Lynch Urban Park. Um, we're very excited about this. We want to get something that's um, challenging and interesting and and relevant and that people can get excited about and will create a strong sense of place um so as for that uh thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day thank you